All right, folks, it sounds like we are live and ready to go. We are on Zoom and we're also being broadcasted through Facebook Live. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Javier Martinez and I'm Executive Director of Partnership for Community Action. I am joined today uh, by a number of uh, sister organizations and their leadership, as well as a number of very much uh, esteemed uh, hosts. Um, before we begin, uh, I have a, a little bit of, uh, of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, we do have an interpreter that is interpreting from English to Spanish. Uh, we have uh, many of our members who are on this call who are monolingual Spanish speakers and who will be using that interpretation feature. Para las personas que nos acompañan esta tarde y necesitan eh, inter, eh, el uso del intérprete, eh, en su pantalla, en la parte de abajo hay un globito con un globo, con un mundo. Eh, si le presionan ahí, pues ahí pueden eh, acceder al, al intérprete. Um, uh, because we are interpreting, I'm asking all of our speakers to please be um, con cognizant of that and to, to speak uh, a little bit more slowly than you would usually speak. Um, and I'm very much guilty of speaking too fast, so I'll try to remind myself to remind you to please slow down. Um, for those reporters that are joining us, uh, if you can please identify yourself by renaming uh, with your name and your media outlet. Uh, and we're going to ask you to use the raised hand feature on Zoom. Um, and at the end of the press conference, we will allow you to come in as a panelist and ask your question of any of our guests here today. Um, uh, to introduce, by, by way of introduction, I'd like to introduce uh, the working group that's putting this press conference together. Uh, this working group came together uh, back in March, although many of our organizations have been working together for over 20 years. Uh, but in terms of this particular project and effort, we came together uh, at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And those groups include El Centro de Igualdad y Derechos here in Albuquerque, Somos Un Pueblo Unido, which is Santa Fe based with a wide, uh, statewide reach, uh, Comunidades en Acción y de Fe, NM Cafe in Las Cruces, uh, New Mexico Voices for Children, here in Albuquerque, Partnership for Community Action, also here in Albuquerque. Uh, and for this specific project, we were very proud to partner with a couple of national groups. One of them is Abriendo Puertas, which is a family engagement um, outfit um, out of California that does nation um, uh, work around the nation. Um, and with Latino Decisions, which is um, a very well respected and, and known uh, polling firm um, out of, uh, Seattle, Washington. The purpose of our working group over the last few months has been to work toward narrowing the information gap between government, government leaders, and Spanish-speaking communities here in New Mexico. Um, as a result of a lot of that work, we have come up with a number of policy recommendations that we have presented to local, state, and our federal leadership to help support the most vulnerable families and their specific local communities here in New Mexico. Um, today, we will be presenting the results of a statewide poll that we commissioned um, and that was conducted by Latino Decisions and Dr. Gabriel Sanchez. Uh, the poll was of Latino families, including immigrants, um, and it demonstrates the economic vulnerability of those families, many of whom have experienced layoffs and income loss, and many of them um, you know, don't qualify uh, for any type of support, um, specifically that federal support that came down under the CARES Act um, a month or two ago. Um, today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Gabriel Sanchez, who will be walking us through that poll. Um, and we will also be hearing from a number of distinguished elected officials. Uh, with us today, we have Mayor Alan Weber of the City of Santa Fe, Mayor uh, Victor Snover of Aztec, we also have Bernalillo County Commissioner Debbie O'Malley and Doña Ana County Commissioner Manny Sanchez. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gabriel Sanchez, who's going to walk us through the poll. Um, take it away, Dr. Sanchez. Excellent. Thank you very much for that overview and warm introduction. I'm now sharing my screen with the audience. Hopefully everybody's able to see that. 
As noted, I'm Professor Sanchez. Uh, many folks know me here at the University of New Mexico and also one of the principals of the team from Latino Decisions. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to have worked on this project. Um, I think as, as you see from the organizations listed, uh, these folks deserve an awful lot of credit for working together and quickly to identify a significant need and information gap. And essentially, I, I had the pleasure of being able to be the pollster that worked on this project. But these folks had the real ingenuity to recognize that without information, we're all wondering what are we supposed to do? They've already been working on serving these communities as it relates to COVID-19. And hopefully, the survey data that I will walk you through today will give us some more insights on what the needs are across the Hispanic community here in the state of New Mexico. I will note that this slide deck, as well as full results to the survey and a short report are all available on our webpage at latinodecisions.com. Uh, so for those of you uh, following along, you don't need to grab data points, you'll be able to access that directly um, if you go to the webpage. So as noted, uh, this survey was specifically focused on Hispanic families here in the state of New Mexico with the survey design of randomly interviewing just under 500 Hispanic parents or primary caregivers of children 18 years of age or younger. And obviously we're focused today on the challenges that COVID-19 has created specifically for these families. Uh, we used a blended approach that included online survey, surveys, live telephone interviews conducted via landline and cell phones. Everything on our team at Latino Decisions is fully bilingual. Uh, so respondents had the opportunity to take the survey in English or Spanish at their discretion. Uh, you see the margin of error uh, for this particular poll. And we also weighted this data to match the demographic distributions of not just Hispanic adults in New Mexico was divided by the US Census, but specifically of parents of children aged 0 to 18. Uh, we were able to actually look at differences across the Hispanic families in New Mexico, including the age of their children. So you get some really in-depth information from this poll. It was conducted from June 4th through June 12, 2020. So it was very recent data, average 20 minutes in length for completion. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the most comprehensive study of any uh, subgroup of the New Mexico population specifically related to COVID-19. We're gonna be focusing pretty specifically today on the survey's content focused on the economic challenges facing Hispanic families across the state of New Mexico give you a little bit of an overview of some of the data points that we have in the survey. And again, you can uh, go to our webpage and grab any specific results that you might be interested in. We always start our surveys at Latino Decisions with an open-ended question that asks individuals in their own words to tell us what the most important issues facing their community that government should address are. In this context, we specifically do related to COVID-19. And what I wanna draw your attention to is despite the fact that there's an awful lot of challenges and needs related to COVID-19 across the community, including access to protective gear, um, having better access to internet and technology for homeschooling, et cetera, the number one issue was help with wages and income. You see almost a third of Hispanic families identified as that being the most important issue that government should address. So that I think tells you really the salience of this issue across our families. And again, keep in mind, this was open-ended. Folks told us in their own words what they felt was the most important issue facing their community. You see a host of other challenges uh, that are reflected in this item, including having access to food, medicine, and basic resources of 24%, and more honest and factual information about COVID-19, which I think speaks to Representative Martinez's point that unfortunately a lot of information is not finding its way to our communities. I think we can do a better job of that, and hopefully the survey is a starting point for being able to do that. To give you an overview of the severe challenges that COVID-19 is imposing on Hispanic families here in the state of New Mexico, one out of every five or 20% of Hispanic families in New Mexico have had someone in their household lose their job since the outbreak of COVID-19. I'll say that again, 20% of Hispanic families across the state of New Mexico have seen somebody in their immediate household lose their job. Another 20% of Hispanic parents or primary caregivers have seen their business shut down or seen significant drops in revenue. Uh, most of you on this call know Hispanic families and Hispanic business owners are a driving piece of small businesses here in the state of New Mexico as they are nationally. So to see that significant drop isn't just important to the Hispanic community, it's important to the overall state's economy. One out of every three 
Parents of primary givers across the state of New Mexico that are Hispanic have had trouble paying for their rent or mortgage. And 48%, so nearly half of the full sample, has had their work hours cut, their pay cut, um, and have uh, fortunately kept their job, but are seeing significant decreases in the amount of money they have to deal with day -to day expenses. In my opinion, one of the most scary data points that I'll share with you this afternoon is the very small safety net that most of our Hispanic families across the state have available to them to deal with emergencies just like this. As you see on the bar chart provided here, nearly half of Hispanic families have $1,000 or less to deal with all of the mounting concerns that they have financially at this very difficult time. Within that, you see that 24% Right? Almost a fourth of Hispanic families have less than $100 in financial reserves to be able to tackle this very difficult time uh, that, that folks are facing as a result of COVID-19. So that gives us some indication already of the significant economic challenges facing Hispanic families and unfortunately the very limited safety net that families have uh, to be available to survive this very difficult economic period. As a consequence of these very difficult times that Hispanic families are facing, unfortunately, far too many are being forced to make very difficult decisions at this time. You see huge percentage of folks are indicating that they've already used up most or all of their savings. You see 24% have postponed or cut back on health-related expenses that they know they should actually do. 24% skipped a monthly car, rent, or mortgage payment. 24% fortunately have access to networks that they're able to borrow money from friends or family right now. Um, unfortunately, a good percentage have had to postpone or quit education or career related expenses. And one that I really wanna draw your attention to is unfortunately 18% of our sample indicated they've had to borrow money from easy loan companies or, or payday um, outfits across the state of New Mexico to deal with this very difficult situation. Most of you know the extremely high interest rates that these folks charge. So these very vulnerable families right now are turning, unfortunately, to those solutions, which can put them in even greater economic peril as we move forward into, unfortunately, the COVID-19 crisis. I think that illustrates some basic public policy many of these organizations have been fighting for to actually impose some limits to the interest that these folks can charge and particularly at this time with so many vulnerable families, unfortunately turning in that direction, I think more now than ever, this is a time for us to think about aggressive policy in that direction. An unfortunate byproduct of so many folks losing their jobs or moving from part-time uh, jobs as a result of this difficult economic time period, you see 23% of the full sample has indicated that they've lost their employer provided health insurance. Among that segment of the population, we followed up and asked if the children in their household had also lost their insurance. And you see that a significant segment of that population, 26% indicates that unfortunately their children have lost access to health insurance as well. You see a very large segment of that population is looking into steps to be able to apply for state funded health care. We all know that was already a gaping issue across the state of New Mexico with the large percentage of our families who are supported by that mechanism. So an increase is only gonna to add to that financial stress for the state. Just one indicator of many that we have in the survey of unfortunately at this very difficult time, we're seeing drops in wages, folks losing their jobs. Unfortunately for many, the costs associated with day-to-day -day activities is unfortunately going up. This one example indicates that 44% of families across the state of New Mexico indicate that their internet or cell phone bill is much higher now because more people are utilizing it, particularly to do homeschooling online. More of us that are able to work from home are having to tap into our Wi-Fi to be able to do that. So that's just one indication of unfortunately day-to-day -day costs going up while unfortunately most Hispanic families across the state are having decreases in wages if they were fortunate enough to be able to keep their job in the first place. Unfortunately, as the survey identifies, despite all of these economic challenges that we're seeing portrayed across the data points I've shared with you already, far too few Hispanic families in the state of New Mexico have access to any financial support right now. You see that overall, 
across the full survey sample, 71% of Hispanic households reported either receiving a $1,200 payment for a single person through the CARES Act, you see that in terms of 40%, or $2,400 payment for a two-person household, right? So unfortunately, that leaves out a large segment, almost 30%, who didn't receive any payment from the CARES Act. And 40% of all families, unfortunately, did not receive any additional payments for their children. Again, keep in mind, 20% of our full sample indicated they have lost their job, unfortunately, as a result of COVID-19. When we followed up with that specific subsegment of the overall sample, you see that overall 67% of that population indicated that they did not receive any unemployment benefits. Right, I'll say that again slightly differently, only 33% actually received unemployment benefits, right? Very small segment of that overall population that could desperately utilize those resources. When we followed up with those folks and asked them specifically why they weren't receiving unemployment benefits, you see the largest percentage of 36% indicating that they were not eligible for unemployment, right? Our sample, we made sure to include a large segment of immigrant families to make sure that we could capture variation. And obviously, as was opened up with, a large segment of our Hispanic households, unfortunately, are not eligible for some of these resources because of their immigration status. You see other challenges, including trying to apply but not being able to get through to the state agency at 13%. 11% indicated that they did apply but were denied unemployment benefits. And unfortunately, again, noting the information that 17% did not know about unemployment benefits to be able to look into utilizing those resources. The survey also included a number of particular policy options available uh, for our elected official community to try to address some of these challenges and needs that we see across our Hispanic families in New Mexico. You see wide support for just about any of these great ideas that we put in front of survey respondents, including 80% of Hispanic families supporting having funding available for state and local governments so they can provide services without having to cut jobs. 80% as well, ensuring paid sick leave for all workers. I know that's an issue on the front of many of our minds right now. I think this data gives us some added energy to continue pushing that forward. Almost 80% expanding unemployment insurance so those out of work receive unemployment benefits. 74% funding for states to provide vote by mail for everybody who wants to access that. 79% funding for COVID-19 treatment for all. 82% funding for more COVID-19 testing for all. 77% creating a new fund for small businesses and self-employed folks to be able to access loans if they weren't able to access those through the federal government's CARES program. 72% allowing children in mixed status families to receive stimulus checks if they weren't eligible. And you see 71% allowing undocumented immigrants here in our community to receive stimulus checks, whether that comes from the federal government or the state. We see here in the state of New Mexico that our Hispanic workers are a vital workforce. In fact, when we asked directly if individuals that still had their job, noting 20% indicated in the survey that they had lost theirs, unfortunately due to COVID-19, if they were continuing to work outside of the home, you see that roughly half of all of our Hispanic employees who have young children at home are outside the home, still continuing to be part of that vital workforce and keeping our economy afloat here in the state of New Mexico. I will say that's higher than the national numbers that we've tracked at Latino Decisions for Hispanic families across the nation. You see some of the jobs reflected when we ask those individuals who are working outside of the home, what part of the workforce do they feel in terms of our economy? You see roughly a third of those folks are in the healthcare industry, whether they're first providers, caregivers, uh, social workers, work in a lab, et cetera. Uh, you see 11% work in the food and agricultural production industry, 17% are helping ensure that the rest of us have access to food through grocery stores and restaurants and a host of other segments of the workforce. So you see the Hispanic community is essentially keeping our economy alive by going outside of the home at this very difficult time, particularly when they have young children at home. Fortunately, this is a ray of good news when I contrast this with the numbers that we see for Hispanics nationally who are still working outside the home. A much greater 
segment of our population here in New Mexico, 82% indicates that their employer provides them with protective equipment such as gloves, masks, or sanitizers. And 88%, which is again significantly higher than what we're seeing nationally for Hispanic workforce, indicates they feel safe performing their job right now. They feel they have the necessary procedures and equipment. This has been noted nationally that New Mexico has been on the forefront of taking aggressive and necessary steps to protect our workforce. And I think it's reflected here in the data. That being said, we obviously had a sizable segment who did not feel safe or does not feel that their employer is providing them with the necessary equipment to be safe on the job. When we asked all of those essential workers what would make them feel safer in their job, you see 84% indicated if all customers and coworkers were obligated to wear a mask, they would feel safer on their job. Nearly 80% if they were allowed to keep a safe distance from coworkers and customers. 87% access to multiple breaks to be able to take the necessary steps like washing their hands frequently to protect themselves and their family. 85% having access to the PPE necessary to be able to keep themselves safe. And these ones, the last, are, are something I wanna point out. 76%, which is very high, indicating that they would love to have job safety training provided specifically by their employer to make sure not just themselves, but the full workforce feels safe and comfortable going to work and providing their essential workforce duties and 80% having access to free COVID-19 testing. Dr. Dr. Sanchez, I'm going to ask you to slow down a little bit um, uh, so that our interpreter can, can catch up with you. Thank you. I, I appreciate the heads up. Unfortunately, only a couple of slides left that I will walk through uh, very slowly, particularly for points of emphasis. In addition to looking specifically at COVID-19, these organizations had the wisdom to take advantage of being able to track policy attitudes and experiences related to the Floyd tragedy, a tragedy that we've seen across the country, to be able to get some assessment of what's happening here in the state of New Mexico. As you see from the data points that I'll walk you through, a sizable segment of our children have watched the video footage showing the police officer placing his knee on Mr. Floyd. I think it's important for all of us to recognize, even if ourselves as parents and primary caregivers are not watching these activities uh, with our children, they're getting access to that information themselves directly. You see that 46% watching with their families, but a sizable segment also watching the video on their own at 21%. One upside is that Hispanic families have clearly used this as an opportunity to speak with their children about racism and racial bias. 82% of Hispanic families here in the state of New Mexico have done just that. I think that gives us some, uh, hopefully, optimism that the next generation after ours will look at these um, unfortunate and tragic experiences and ensure that they don't have to deal with this as they age into adulthood. Another very positive and powerful data point from the survey is that 89% of Hispanic caregivers and parents across the state of New Mexico agree with this statement. I can understand the pain and frustration that the black community feels right now with law enforcement because Latinos face similar experiences with law, law enforcement. Unfortunately, New Mexico has a rough record as it relates to police brutality particularly here in the city of Albuquerque. And I think this data point reflects, unfortunately, the concerns that all New Mexicans, including the Hispanic community, feel about this really important issue that has really captured the attention of the nation, unfortunately, during this tough period. As a consequence of this, we see far too many of our parents, 77%, feel concerned that their child may experience excessive force from police at some point in their lifetime. That's an eye-popping statistic. 77% are concerned that their child will unfortunately experience some excessive force from police at some point in their lifetime. I think that speaks to that underlying thread of really standing in solidarity with the African-American community at this time, because unfortunately far too many of our communities of color across the state of New Mexico feel very similarly because of the difficult experiences they have had in their lifetime. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of these data points with you. I welcome your feedback and your questions. 
Uh, you all can reach me at my email address that is provided here if you have any other follow-up questions that we aren't able to cover at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez, for this um, great piece of work. Um, you know, we, we are definitely lucky to have somebody of your expertise here in our state um, helping um, inform the public as to these very critical issues. You know, when it comes to economic relief for these families, um, you know, no one has been working harder uh, than the next people here on my list. Um, you know, they say that all politics are local, um, and I would, I would agree with that, and I would also agree with all good policy is local sometimes. And so we are very fortunate to have these four leaders here with us today who will give some reaction um, to, to, to all of us. And before we go there, I am going to remind members of the media um, to please um, rename yourselves with your media outlet so that we can keep track of who's on this call. And if you do have questions, to please use the raise hand option of Zoom. And at some point here uh, at the end of our presentations, we'll let you in as a panelist so that you can ask your question uh, yourself. So um, I'm going to go first to uh, my good friend, uh, the mayor of the city of Santa Fe, Alan Weber, for some remarks. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you and, and uh, to be with such a great group of people. And thank you, uh, Dr. Sanchez, for such a terrific presentation. I think the, the numbers sadly speak for themselves. Uh, we not only have an information gap uh, that you're trying to fill, we have a fairness gap, we have an equity gap, uh, we have a financial liability gap uh, that we all need to speak to. Uh, here in Santa Fe, uh, roughly 15% of our residents uh, are immigrants and a considerable number of them are mixed status immigrants. Uh, and they are, as your survey data indicate, uh, frontline and essential workers. They keep our people safe. They take care of our community. They provide absolutely essential services in so many different ways, uh, from tourism and hospitality to public safety and overall well-being in our community. And yet when it comes to being included, in the CARES Act, they are ignored, they are shunted aside, they are, for all intents and purposes, invisible. Now, that is a huge inequity. It's unfair to those individuals, it's unfair to the families, it's unfair to our whole state, uh, which ends up losing uh, something in the neighborhood of $55 million that we and our people need in order to get through this very troubled time that combines a global pandemic with an economic aftershock. Uh, in Santa Fe, it translates into a $3.5 million uh, shortfall of money that can help people get across this gap uh, that is costing them, in some cases, their homes, their family's well-being, putting undue stress on them uh, in an unfair and inequitable way. It hurts them and it hurts all of us in Santa Fe and in New Mexico. What's unfair for one is unfair for all. Uh, and so I think the purpose of this uh, event is to shine a light on this, to call for remedial action from the federal government, from the state government, and to recognize that we really are all in this together. We need to work collaboratively. Uh, we need to work collectively to redress this inequity. And then going forward to support families, workers, our whole community as we get through COVID-19 and the financial impact that it's created. So I want to join uh, up with everyone on this call, with the people who sponsored this really essential piece of work uh, to shed light on this inequity and to go to work to fix it. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mayor Weber. Thank you for all the good work that you are doing uh, uh, up in your community. Uh, next, we have uh, the mayor of Aztec, <coughs> Mr. Victor Snover. And, and thank you, sir, for, for all the good work that you're doing as well. 
Um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, I've, I've followed your career from afar. Uh, obviously I'm in Albuquerque, so don't get up to Aztec that much, but I've, I've definitely followed the good work that you're doing. And, and so, uh, we're excited to have you here on this call and, and to hear your reaction to what you just heard. Well, thanks Javier, um, mayor, uh, Dr. Sanchez, all the other folks and, and organizations. Um, I mean, after seeing the presentation, I, I, uh, I did learn, I learned several things, but you kind of figure there's kind of an underlying, I'm not super surprised, I guess is what I'm saying, which is very telling, I think, in, in today's world. I, I think that we are, we're really missing the mark as, as a society, as, uh, as elected officials and as a federal government. Um, uh, and I wish I had better answers, you know, today, but I, I'm, I'm humbled to be here and to be asked to be part of this. I mean, immigrants uh, living in the United States, specifically in my region in New Mexico, you know, regardless of their status, have long been the backbone of our society. Um, without them, our economy would literally collapse, you know, uh, as we're seeing. Um, you know, the shared values of hard work, strong families and safe communities, you know, they make us all better as a society. These are all uh, what we like to claim as American values, but they're, they're just values of, of hardworking and uh, strong family, you know, bond, bonds that bond us all. It's not, it's not uh, unique to America or to, uh, you know, to legal status or whatever that may be. Um, these same folks work at jobs, you know, they pay taxes, uh, and because of their contributions, should also be given the very same considerations, you know, that any of us that do the same. You know, I work, I pay taxes, um, I contribute to the economy, but I'm no, not in any greater capacity than anybody else just because I happen to have a, you know, a different ethnic background. Um, and I was, and I just happen to be born in the United States. Um, you know, we're facing our American society, you know, we're, we should expect during difficult times, like the ones that we're, that we've all found ourselves in over the last several months, um, that, you know, we should be there to help one another. We should be willing to put any of our political partisanship aside. Uh, coronavirus is not a Republican or a Democrat or a conservative or a liberal. Um, it's brought devastation around the world, but it's specifically even in my backyard is one of the hot spots in you know for a while there in the nation um you know it doesn't know any relace any race or religion and certainly not immigration status and and i'm sorry you know it's just patently un-american to allow some folks to suffer and to be left behind and uh disregarded merely because of something that they have on their driver's license or on their birth certificate or you know uh a quote unquote status uh, of legality, um, which even during the best of times, in my opinion, is absolutely absurd. Uh, but especially now, um, we are the richest country in the world and we have the means to help people. And that is, um, that's what we should be doing. And, and I, you know, I echo the, the statements of the mayor um, and I'm sure of some of the other panelists that will be speaking that uh, it is, more important now than ever to uh, link arms and to fight for these these uh, benefits, these things that I, that are well deserved from every for everybody to get us through this. Um, folks are going to be spending their money at the same place as I am, and and it's just economics. Put put the partisanship and the you know your issues about immigration or whatever aside. Um, folks are going to spend money, and it's going to help keep our economy moving forward uh, if they have it. And, um, but from a more humanitarian standpoint, it's the right thing to do to help your brothers and sisters, regardless of what they look like or what their last names are, or where they came from. And uh, with that, I'll uh, let the next speaker go ahead, but I appreciate the time and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your words. And, and again, thank you for your work. Uh, it takes a, a great deal of leadership uh, to do the good work that you're doing. Uh, you know, many of these smaller communities uh, in, in rural parts of New Mexico, relatively speaking, have, uh, you know, large populations of, of undocumented immigrant families. And every dollar that doesn't come to them uh, in the form of support 
uh, from federal government is a dollar that is not being spent uh, in that local economy. So the impact on, on some of those smaller communities uh, is being felt uh, a, lot, a lot deeper than perhaps uh, those of us who live in, in bigger, bigger cities and bigger communities. I should note that there is a letter that has been signed uh, by close to 50 local elected officials across the state that has been sent to our congressional delegation uh, requesting that, that they fight uh, and that they work hard to include everybody into the next round of, of, uh, of relief coming down from the federal government. Uh, the next person on my list, and I take great pride in, um, in introducing her because she was one of the original community organizers that went on to a career in elected politics. Uh, and um, County Commissioner W. O'Malley has been a staple of local government, first as a member of the Albuquerque City Council, um, and now as a member of the Bernalillo County Commission, representing, I should add, the original North Valley. Uh, and I know County Commissioner Sanchez is on the call and we'll hear from him later, but he represents the other North Valley, just an FYI. Commissioner O'Malley, please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Javier Martinez. Um, uh, buenas tardes. Uh, uh, as uh, I, I don't want to sort of repeat the same statements, so I'll just sort of look this up. I have a, a written statement. So uh, essentially, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has exposed and exasperated, exacerbated, sorry, the social, racial, and economic inequalities that exist in our in our nation. We recognize the the economic, cultural, and civic contributions that immigrants make, and we are proud of our legacy of passing policies that reflect that. Since the pandemic hit, I have had the opportunity to hear from many Bernalillo County residents, including low-wage immigrant workers. Immigrant and low-wage workers have always played a vital role in our economy and have always been essential workers. We recognize their crucial role on the front lines of this pandemic and the health risks they have been taking to keep our city, our county running. Low-wage workers in Burleigh County keep our grocery stores stocked. They take care of the children of medical professionals and first responders, take care of our elderly loved ones in nursing homes as domestic workers. They keep our plumbing running, continue to roof our homes, and are the restaurant workers who allow the rest of us to safely pick up our food to go. It's not okay for workers to be recognized as essential, yet to be treated as dispensable. What I hear from constituents supports the data that has been released today. I'm hearing from constituents that have no means to take care of their basic needs and simply have no safety net to count on. If we are listening, it shouldn't surprise us to hear the data that one in three Latino parents or primary caregivers in New Mexico with minor children have had trouble paying for their rent or mortgage during this crisis. It shouldn't surprise us that 48% have had the work hours cut or their pay cut. And it shouldn't surprise us, but the results of this poll, they represent a call to action, as many people feel like people need. This poll should serve as a reminder that we cannot rebuild our economy by excluding such a vital part of our community. We stand with New Mexico congressional delegation in advocating for the most inclusive federal relief possible. As a state and local governments, especially those that receive federal aid in the CARES Act, we must do our part as well. As New Mexicans, we need to work together at the national, state, and local levels to ensure all families have the economic support and workers' protection needed during this unprecedented crisis. We just got to ask. <laughs> Thank you. Muchas gracias, Comisionada. Thank you, Commissioner Malley. Thank you for your words and thank you for joining us today um, and for all of the good work that you've done here um, on behalf of these issues for a long, long time. Uh, next, we have um, County Commissioner um, Manny Manuel Sanchez from Doña Ana County. And you know, if, if, I try to remind my colleagues and anyone that listened to me when we talk about the immigration debate, 
uh, the reality along the borderland is different. It's a different universe. You know, the, 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 that line that divides those two countries uh, doesn't really exist in a way, culturally speaking. Um, and, and I'm very uh, happy and honored to have with us uh, our county commissioner, from, county commissioner from Doñana County, uh, born in El Paso, so he understands uh, what that line looks like. I, um, I was also born there and, and you know, it's, it's just a different universe. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing some thoughts with us and, and giving us some more context as to these discussions. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Representative, and, and I agree. It's, you know, we're, you know, we, we live here. It's, we're just one community uh, along the border. I know that uh, obviously there's um, the people uh, in, in Washington like to make it seem like there's, uh, you know, a huge difference or there's a made, we have some major issues here, but it, it's clearly not. Like I said, I think it's, um, you know, down here we've, we've, this is just what, what we've done for years. It's, we've grown up like this. This is all one community. Um, and you know, I, I, one of the things that, that we've seen right now is this is really challenging times for all of us with, with the, with the public health emergency. And really, even more so for those that are uh, are most vulnerable, which is includes our our immigrants, particularly here in Doniana County. Um, you know, we were when when our leaders are trying to find ways that they can help in our community, it, it's too easy and too often uh, our our immigrant uh, brothers and sisters are are overlooked. Um, and and you know, especially here, like I said, we're we're one community, and, and immigrants are an integral part of our of our county. Uh, especially the district that, uh, that that I represent, you you mentioned um, having me having the North Valley, and that's exactly it. We have um, everywhere. I have the northern part of Las Cruces all the way up to Hatch and Garfield, and one of the big parts of of that community is is the agricultural component within Doniana County, um, and and we're seeing it uh, every you know, especially right now. Uh, so many uh, of of our of our uh, of our immigrant community work out doing the, the these hard jobs um, and and I know uh, with the work of cafe we've been trying to really make sure that they have safe working conditions as uh, dr. Sanchez had pointed out um, so you know they 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 go to work uh, the same as we do the as we all do they go their, their kids go to school um, and and they're going through the same challenges uh, but yet you know we've seen our, our uh, leadership uh, some of the leadership in, in Washington that provided billions of dollars to corporations when really uh, the people need it. And so that's what I'm, I'm really asking that, you know, we're looking at our, at our uh, congressional delegation and really all of our leaders in Washington, DC, that they uh, really work to make sure that they are uh, having a solution that, that looks at all of us uh, in our communities, not just the, not just the, the few. So I'm um, like I said, I, I hope that they will uh, listen to this call from us in these communities here in, in New Mexico and Doniana County, uh, that they don't turn away from our immigrant families that are most vulnerable this time, and that they work to try to find a solution that uh, works for us all. The 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 people that are that are doing the the you know, that, that do the work and, and live together on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you, Representative. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, we, we appreciate you um, sharing your, um, your thoughts with us and, and, you know, giving us a little bit more context of what's happening down there. Um, while we um, wait for anybody who uh, would like to raise their hand, uh, members of the press, um, we are gonna be opening this up for questions. Um, before I go there, I just I want to reiterate uh, the importance um, of, of, of the context that these numbers, this data gives to the plight of those who have been left behind during the pandemic. Uh, fortunately, it's not too late. Um, you know, we can still work on policies um, that ensure that every member of our community is given that, um, you know, that step up. That, that we have all, you know, that we're all needing right now in these very complicated uh, times. So uh, with that, uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. And uh, first on the list here, I have Ms. Uh, uh, Marisa Armas uh, with K-O-A-T. Uh, Ms. Armas, please uh, go ahead. 
Muted, unmuted now. You are. Awesome. You. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Mar Marisa Armas with KOAT. First thing is just why gather this data and why focus it on the Latino community? I feel that um, in mainstream media, even like, like many of you have already said, um, it's almost like they're invisible, but why did we feel the need to gather this data and bring it to the forefront? So I'm going to, I'm going to send that over to Dr. Dr. Sanchez, and then uh, I can add a few words after that. Good to see you, Ms. Armas. Great question. Um, I think part of the reason specifically for doing this survey in New Mexico is, although Latino Decisions has done a few national COVID-19 surveys that folks might have seen, unfortunately, because of New Mexico's population size, when I try to tabulate out New Mexicans, I usually have 10 to 20 respondents. And I've been asked by so many folks to answer some of these basic questions about the Hispanic community in New Mexico, but unfortunately, they have been ignored. And we didn't have any raw data to really put to our anecdotal evidence of what we're seeing in the community with the needs and the struggles of our community right now. I think always being able to actually have some semblance of actual data can inform policy decisions, can inform the work of nonprofit organizations like those that commissioned this survey to increase their efficiency in trying to serve as many folks that need the resources that are vital at this time. And, and another question I have is, um, I know that locally in Albuquerque, you know, like the Dream Team had created a GoFundMe account to fundraise for undocumented families and they dispersed a lot of that money to individuals in our community. But what, what other type of relief is, is available to help these families right now um, because they, they don't qualify for any federal help? So, so that, that's a great question, uh, Marisa, and I can take that. Uh, you, you are correct. Uh, grassroots organizations like the Dream Team, uh, my own organization, along with Nusenda Credit Union, um, have, um, have come up with a, a zero interest loan program for, for members of, of many of these organizations to, to access. Uh, there's a national group called Family Independence Initiative that brought in over $50,000 uh, to, to gift out to, to families who, who fit this same description. Um, you know, but obviously those, those efforts um, would have to be scaled up, you know, and so uh, we know that there is support for, uh, in the city of Albuquerque, for example, um, you know, they put out a $1 million fund uh, a few, a couple months ago to help support um, in terms of COVID relief, many of those same families. Uh, but we want more, you know, I think those families want more and expect more and deserve more. And, and that's why this call is going up to the federal government to make sure that these families are included in that next round of relief. Okay, and then just final question here is just, you know, I know people are gonna watch this later today and say, oh, well, everyone's struggling, you know, the Navajo Nation and small business is struggling. Um, why is it important that we are talking about Latinos and um, people in our border communities? Like, why do we need to just make sure that, you know, I mean, yes, you know, Navajo Nation, a lot of other communities are being hit pretty extreme as well, communities of color specifically, but why do we need to make sure that we're looking at Latinos and the undocumented community? Uh, that's a great question, and I'll, I'll, I'll have one of my panelists here jump in as well. Uh, you know, I think everybody deserves uh, support and deserves relief. Um, you know, we know the state of New Mexico, for example, um, just passed a uh, small business loan uh, program uh, that is very low interest that is designed to help the smallest of businesses across the state. Um, you know, we also know that, uh, uh, you know, the federal government has failed in part in deploying funds, for example, to the Navajo Nation. And these are all fights that, you know, we, we are all together in. Um, and, and this is not about excluding one group for the sake of another one. Uh, but our lane, you know, as organizations is, um, you know, the, the immigrant community. And so that's why this particular effort uh, even though it's focused on that community, uh, you know, it, it certainly needs to be expanded and everybody in this state and everybody in this country who's been impacted by COVID, especially low wage working people deserve more support. I don't know if any other panelists wants to jump in. If, yeah, Javier, oh, go ahead. Please, please go ahead, Commissioner. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, it's, it's just a fact that many of the low a low uh, wage earners are immigrants. And so uh, they fall into that category that of, of families and children who, with the children who need help. And so I think that's one of the reasons for the focus there. Uh, and, and I just wanted to add that uh, the county as well has, uh, they put out 
we recently put out uh, five million dollars in, in grants to businesses, and that includes immigrant businesses up to ten thousand dollars. But that doesn't go directly to help families necessarily, and that's where the gap is. And we are looking at other other options available. There's other cities, other states that that uh, have to have different programs and have different models, and we are looking at those to help this to help the, the sector of community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mayor Snover. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would just like to kind of add um, toward to, to the commissioner's point and to uh, Ms. Armas' question. Um, up here in Aztec, in the, in the, you know, the northwest corner of the state, we're a little bit more familiar as a border community for the Navajo Nation. But um, uh, and one thing I just want to give a little plug for our, our, one of our big nonprofit food providers, Echo Food Bank, which they also have uh, a pretty big distribution center in Albuquerque as well. But uh, one of the things, and one of the concrete things we were able to do was to get them to relax some of their ID requirements and their social security number requirements and things like that. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, and I kind of said that in the little statement that I was able to make at the start, I don't, I don't really think it, it's, who cares where you're from? You know, we're, we all get hungry and we all need food. Um, and we should be able as the richest country in the world to be able to provide food for people in their most, most basic needs. But uh, to a little bit more directly to the question, uh, many of us here have positions, especially elected officials, uh, and I feel like it's one of my duties, uh, whether it affects me directly, you know, in my daily life or not, uh, to be a voice for the folks that don't have a voice. I mean, it's really quite that simple is to advocate for folks that have, they don't have people in DC, they don't have lobbyists and they don't have a lot of folks that are standing up for their and taking up their cause. So uh, at the end of the day, I think it's our duty uh, as public servants to, to take up that cause. And right now, uh, one of the folks that are being affected the most is the immigrant community. And uh, I'm proud to be able to kind of champion that cause in any any way that I can. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and, and thank you for joining us, Ms. Armas. Uh, we, we appreciate your, your time. Uh, next on my... Rep yes. Can I Mayor. just weigh in for one quick second? I don't want to pile sure. on. I think the comments have been really uh, well stated, but I think uh, the question deserves a little bit more um, uh, investigation. Um, you know, what's, everybody needs help. There's no doubt about it. This, as, as my fellow panelists have said, this is a disease that doesn't discriminate uh, among the people it chooses to attack. And we're all vulnerable and we all need to help each other. Uh, but what the data uh, from this uh, study say to me is that those who are among the most essential in our community are also the most vulnerable. And they're most vulnerable in so many ways. And I'm not a polling expert like Dr. Sanchez, but if you look at the cross tabs and you put the picture together, uh, the Hispanic community that was surveyed are not only financially at risk in losing jobs, in having very few resources that they can fall back on, uh, in being vulnerable uh, in the workplace because they are people who are frontline workers, uh, but they're also expressly excluded from the CARES Act. It is almost an intentional attack on this community by people in Washington, D.C. And so while everybody deserves help, when there is a, an intentional effort to undermine the economic, the health, other forms of well-being, of one particular group in our community, it's incumbent upon all of us to step up and represent their interests and say they need to be taken into account equally with everyone else. And that's the, right, the wrong that we're trying to right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Weber. We appreciate you. Uh, let's go to Mayra Aguilar from Univision. Buenas tardes. Eh, ¿Puedo hacer mi pregunta en español? Sí, habla en español y yo la interpreto. Uh, Mayra is going to ask her question in Spanish, and I will interpret for, for those of you who need it. 
Bueno, eh, primeramente muchas gracias y eh, quería, quería preguntar, eh, entonces, ¿qué, ¿qué es lo que sigue? Eh, ya sé que ya había hablado con usted eh, especialmente durante... Um, antes de la última sesión eh, especial y qué, se ve, qué es lo que se iba a ver si existiera como una legislación uh, para ayudar a las familias inmigrantes. Uh, pero, ¿cómo se, se viera ¿no? una legislación o una política uh, para poder ayudar? Porque sabemos que mucha gente está bastante desesperada. Incluso nosotros recibimos eh, muchas de estas llamadas de personas que ya eh, han llamado a muchos lugares, incluso ya han recibido mucha ayuda de muchas organizaciones, pero eh, no, no completan uh, para vivir al, al día? Bueno, eh, so the question is, uh, what, what's next? What, 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 what does this policy proposal look like? Um, and and uh, as has been stated before, many of these families have received perhaps some support from local uh, community organizations or, or faith-based organizations, but clearly it's not enough. It's not scaled up to where it needs to be. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, answer the, I'll answer the question generally, but then I'll, I, can, I will uh, have you make any type of comments that, that, you, that you'd like. Um, and I'll, I'll go in English first and then I'll go in Spanish. Uh, I, I think the, the ask is very simple. Um, as the next round of relief is getting worked out in Congress, uh, that uh, undocumented families are included. As the mayor expressed um, earlier, those families were specifically excluded from the CARES Act. And, and that's just not right. It's, it's, it's immoral, it's counterproductive, it is a wrong-headed policy decision that was made in Washington. Uh, so the ask is very simple, include these families and any other families that have been excluded into the next round of relief. Eh, la, la, la respuesta es muy simple a, a su pregunta. Queremos que a las familias que fueron excluidas de la primera ronda de, de apoyo del gobierno federal, que no sean excluidas en la segunda y tercera y cuarta ronda que venga, eh, es, es muy simple, es, es, una, es, una, es una petición muy simple que le estamos haciendo al gobierno federal, ya que las familias indocumentadas fueron excluidas específicamente de la primera ronda. Eh, Does anybody else want to add anything to that statement? Um, and we will have Peter go from your comments in English to, to Spanish. Eh, Mayra, eh, si hay comentarios de, la, de los panelistas en inglés, eh, Peter te va a interpretar al español, okay? Go ahead, anybody. I don't really have <laughs> much expertise on, on that policy stuff, but I, I would just kind of add that um, because of the fact, like the mayor said, and like you reiterated, Javier, about the, you know, it was an intentional exclusion. And um, on top of that, the, the, the relief bill was something that was, that was very hastily put together because of the urgency of it. Um, and I feel like from my, what little communication and, and limited communication I've had with any of our congressional delegation or their representatives, I feel like they are, they're, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put words in anybody's mouth, this is just my own interpretation of, of the conversation, is that they're trying to take this opportunity to try and plug some of the holes that they, they missed um, and to fight harder because there has been a little bit more time from the, you know, the inception of the first um, stimulus to this one to fight harder and to, to really kind of maybe dig in on some of these more important, you know, issues that were, that were lost last time because of the urgency that was tagged on this, on this relief bill. So I'm hoping, you know, in the feedback, at least that we've gotten from our New Mexico delegations that they are very, uh, you know, they're rolling up their sleeves and they're ready to fight for for this, uh, for the immigrant community this time around even harder to make sure that, you know, in any way that they can to get as much inclusion as possible. So that's really all I have to add, but thank you. That's right. And, and I should also note, uh, as I said at the beginning of this press conference, uh, all of these groups have been actively working with the governor's staff, specifically uh, folks at the uh, human uh, health and human services department, trying to find, um, um, ways to ensure that immigrant families can access 
um, some sort of, of, of support system through the state. Um, and, and I'm happy to say that the, 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 the administration has been very, very supportive um, and have been, I think, moving the ball forward uh, as, as, as hard and as, as fast as they can. Uh, of course, also counting on that federal support, right, on, on, on CARES Act money or, or HEROES money that might come in a little bit later. Um, and then the great work that the locals have been doing as well. So um, uh, uh, with that, uh, I will move on to our next. Uh, oh, Mayra, ¿ya terminaste o tienes más preguntas? Do you have any other questions, Mayra? No, por ahora no. I'm, I'm good right now. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we are going to go to, uh, 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 and uh, Mr. Diamasa, I'm going to butcher that first name, but uh, is it Algernon Al Al Diamasa? Very good. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Buenas um, tardes. Uh, a question first for Dr. Sanchez, and then uh, anyone on the panel could might uh, be able to speak to this. I am wondering if the data that you collected, Dr. Sanchez, and you were assessing um, costs for daily things, such as impact of um, the impact of uh, internet services. If you had data on people reporting that they did not have access to broadband or or internet service at all, and whether there's uh, whether the other panelists have indications that there are um, gaps in internet service for the uh, he's back in the next few minutes. And, and Dr. Sanchez, I, uh, did you, I, on my end, it was breaking up considerably. Did you catch the question or should we have Mr. Diamasa uh, repeat it? I, I think I caught enough of it to give it a shot and let me know, okay. sir, if I, if I didn't catch your question, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Uh, the survey did ask uh, some content specifically regarding internet access, uh, specifically in the context of challenges that might provide uh, for homeschooling. Again, keep in mind the sample was of Hispanic families um, and if you go to the webpage and you look at uh, the data points, you'll see there's a lot of content that we didn't release today that is more in that area uh, that I know these, these folks are interested in releasing at some point in the near future that specifically talks about some of those challenges with broadband access. Uh, our UNM shop also, uh, Center for Social Policy, put out a pretty extensive report specifically looking at broadband access for tribal communities and the challenges that's posing uh, for those communities as well. I hope that's what your question was pertaining to. Mr. Diamas, are you there? Can you hear us? Uh, uh, Hello? Can you hear us? Okay, tell you what, we're, we're gonna move on to the next uh, um, uh, reporter, but we can come back to you um, if, if, you have, uh, if you have more questions. Uh, we have Nash Jones. Um, I believe with KUNM. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Can you hear me? Welcome. We can hear you. Great. You're on the line. Yeah. So, K KUNM. Um, so my first question is for Dr. Sanchez. Um, there can be barriers to disclosing immigration status to a surveyor. So knowing that, I wonder how this information was collected and, and whether the way it was asked allowed you to ascertain how many of the, I believe it's 165 immigrant respondents are undocumented. And I asked this while understanding that, that asking this question could have negatively impacted your response rate out of, you know, potentially concern over how the information could be used or, or other concerns. Um, so I guess the second question would be whether you believe it did impact your response rate. Great question, uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, fortunately, our firm at Latino Decisions specializes in surveys of the Latino and immigrant community. Uh, so we're very thoughtful in, in how we approach uh, these surveys to ensure that we don't ask any invasive questions, including specifically asking folks about their documentation that could impact not only if they participate in the study, but the responses that they give. Um, I'll say both our reputation as a, as a polling firm that's very trusted in these communities and more importantly, the organizations uh, that we were working on behalf. Uh, those folks, when we basically open up the survey, we say we're uh, talking with you today on behalf of and reference some of those groups that I know have a trusted brand in these communities. And I think the fact that we were able to get 
such a high number of, of immigrant families to participate in this study really reflects the fact that I think these folks are hoping that their voice is heard. Unfortunately, most of the polls that I see conducted in the state of New Mexico are only done in English. And as a consequence of that, we unfortunately never hear from not only our immigrant communities, but our Spanish speaking US born Hispanic communities. Uh, so for all of those reasons, no, I'm, I'm not worried about that in the context of this particular survey, uh, but I definitely am worried when I see some of the other numbers that are out there. Okay, thank you. And so it, it isn't, um, it isn't part of your data set then to understand how many of your immigrant respondents are undocumented or what their documentation status is. Is that right? Not in this particular project from what I recall, but I do have those data points from other New Mexico surveys that we've conducted this past year. If you, if you tag me, I can share those with you. Oh, that would be great. Thank you. And, and just one more question. I apologize. I don't want to take up too much space. But for Representative Martinez, um, who were the authors of the letter that you referenced to the congressional delegation? Um, and is that letter available publicly? And have you received a response? Uh, so that letter was just sent. Um, I believe it was sent earlier today. So, so no response yet. Uh, the letter was uh, written uh, by the working group, by all the organizations that are a part of this effort. Um, and as signatories, we have, I believe, close to 50, um, uh, 50 local elected officials from across the state. Um, I, I, I believe that letter is public or, or will be public here shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from members of the press? Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you to, uh, to all of our panelists. Thank you once again, County Commissioner Manuel Sanchez, County Commissioner Debbie O'Malley, uh, Aztec Mayor Victor Snover, Santa Fe Mayor Alan Weber. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gabriel Sanchez and the entire team at Latino Decisions for all of the good work that you've put into this project. Um, also, I want to thank all of the good uh, people at each of the organizations that are a part of this effort, starting with El Centro de Igualdad de Derechos, Somos Un Pueblo Unido, New Mexico Cafe, New Mexico Voices for Children, Partnership for Community Action, um, and Abriendo Puertas. Um, we will be sending out um, um, uh, press packets for, for all of you um, here shortly. If you don't have those yet, uh, I'm sure you'll be getting them soon. Um, and, you know, uh, again, this project is really uh, our effort to ensure that our, all of our families in New Mexico are taken care of and that they receive the support that they need. Uh, these families uh, pray with us in our churches. Their kids go to school with our kids. They are neighbors. They are workers. They are the essential workers in these times of, of, um, of need. So we should take care of them as well. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, members of the press, for joining us. And with that, we will be signing off. Have a great day. Thank you.